Hello everyone, in this video we are going to start learning about cancer, basic properties of a cancer cell, the causes of cancer, the genetics of cancer, new strategies for combating cancer and experimental pathways, the discovery of oncogenes. So all these topics should be very carefully learned and if you are a beginner let's start learning from here. If you already know these topics, let's use this video series as a quick recap to learn about more points or to refresh your memory about all these topics. So let's start. Cancer is a genetic disease because it can be traced to alterations within specific genes. But in most cases, it is not an inherited disease. In an inherited disease, the genetic defect is present in the chromosomes of a parent and is transmitted to the zygote. In contrast, the genetic alterations that led to most cancers arise in the DNA of a somatic cell during the lifetime of affected individual. Because of these genetic changes, cancer cells become freed from many of the restraints to which normal cells are subjected. Normal cells do not divide unless they are stimulated to do so by body's homeostatic machinery. Nor do they survive if they have incurred irreparable damage. Nor do they wander away from a tissue to start new colonies elsewhere in the body. In contrast, most cancer cells experience a breakdown in all of these regulatory influences that protect the body from use and self-destruction. Most importantly, cancer cells proliferate uncontrollably, producing malignant tumors that invade surrounding healthy tissues. As long as the growth of the tumor remains localized, the disease can usually be treated and cured by surgical removal of the tumor. But malignant tumors tend to metastasize, that is to spawn renegade cells that break away from the parent mass, enter the lymphatic or vascular circulation and spread to distant sites in the body where they establish lethal secondary tumors or metastases that are no longer amenable to surgical removal. The subject of metastasis is discussed in the human perspective and Because of its impact on human health and the hope that a cure might be developed, cancer has been the focus of a massive research effort for decades. So let's learn basic properties of a cancer cell. The behavior of cancer cells is most easily studied when the cells are growing in culture. Cancer cells can be obtained by removing a malignant tumor dissociating the tissue into its separate cells and culturing the cell in vitro. Over the years, many different lines of cultured cells that were originally derived from human tumors have been collected in cell banks and are available for study. Alternatively, normal cells can be converted to cancer cells by treatment with carcinogenic chemicals, radiation or tumor viruses. Cells that have been transformed in vitro by chemicals or viruses can generally cause tumors when introduced into a suitable host animal. Because of the impact of cancer on human health and the hope that a cure might be developed, cancer has been the focus of a massive research effort for decades. Through the studies are held led to a remarkable breakthrough in our understanding of the cellular and molecular basis of cancer. They have not had a major impact on either preventing the occurrence of or increasing the chances of surviving most cancers. This has been progress, however, in 2011, the American Association for Cancer Research reported that the rates for all cancers combined dropped during the years between 1990 and 2007 by about 22% for men and 14% for women. Much of this progress is attributed to earlier diagnostic purpose and treatment 
of three major types of cancers like breast cancer, prostate cancer and colon cancer. The incidence of various types of cancer in the United States and the corresponding mortality rates are very important. So lung and bronchus cancer is very high. Later prostate cancer, then breast cancer. After that, colorectal cancer, then lymphomas, then bladder cancer, melanoma, kidney cancer, leukemia, pancreatic cancer, brain and nerve cancer, ovarian cancer and soft tissue cancer. So highest death rate in relation with cancer cases is you know seen in case of pancreatic cancer. Similarly, in case of lung and <coughs> bronchus cancer. So, lung and bronchus cancer is, you know, very high occurrence, is of very high occurrence. And soft tissue cancer is of very small occurrence. Most current treatments such as chemotherapy and radiation lack the specificity needed to kill cancer cells without simultaneously damaging normal cells as evidenced by the serious side effects that accompany these treatments. As a result, patients cannot usually be subjected to high enough doses of chemicals or radiation to kill all of the tumor cells in their body. Researchers have been working for many years to develop more effective and less Irritating targeted therapies. Some of these newer strategies in cancer therapy will be discussed later. So, next, at the same time, there are a number of basic properties that are shared by cancer cells regardless of their tissue of origin. At the cellular level, the most important characteristic of a cancer cell, whether residing in the body or on a culture dish, is its loss of growth control. The capacity for growth and division is not dramatically different between a cancer cell and most normal cells. When normal cells are grown in tissue culture under conditions that promote cell proliferation, they grow and divide at a rare rate similar to that of their malignant counterparts. However, when the normal cells proliferate to the point where they cover the bottom of the culture dish, their growth rate decreases markedly and they tend to remain as a single layer or mono layer of the cell. Growth rates drop, drop as normal cells respond to inhibitory influences from their environment. Growth inhibiting influences may arise as a result of depletion of growth factors in the culture medium or from contact with surrounding cells in the dish. In contrast, when malignant cells are cultured under the same condition, they continue to grow, piling on top of one another to form clumps. This is evident that malignant cells are not responsive to the types of signals that cause their normal counterparts to cease growth and division. Not only do cancer cells ignore inhibitory growth signals, they continue to grow in the absence of stimulatory growth signals that are required by normal cells. Normal cells growing in culture depend on growth factors such as epidermal growth factor and insulin that are present in serum, the fluid fraction of blood which is usually added to the growth medium. Cancer cells can proliferate in the absence of serum because their cell cycle does not depend on the interaction between growth factors and their receptors which are located at the cell surface. As we will see below, this transformation is a result of basic changes in the intracellular pathways that govern cell proliferation and survival. 
Abnormal cells growing in culture exhibit a limited capacity for cell division after a finite number of mitotic divisions. They undergo an aging process that renders them unfit to continue to grow and divide. Cancer cells on the other hand are seemingly immortal because they continue to divide indefinitely. This difference in growth potential is often attributed to the presence of telomerase in cancer cells and its absence in normal cells. Telomerase is the enzyme that maintains the telomeres at the ends of the chromosomes, thus allowing cells to continue to divide. The absence of telomerase from most types of normal cells is thought to be one of the body's major defects that protects against tumor growth. So absence of telomerase is a good sign. Then the most striking alterations in the nucleus following transformations occur within the chromosomes. The most striking alterations in the nucleus following transformations occur within the chromosomes. Unlike normal cells that replicate their DNA at a very low error rate, cancer cells are genetically unstable and often have highly aberrant chromosomal complements, a conclusion termed aneuploidy, which may occur primarily as a result of defects in the mitotic checkpoint defect in mitotic checkpoint or the presence of an abnormal number of centrosomes abnormal number of centrosomes it is evident that the growth of cancer cells is much less dependent on a standard diploid chromosome content than the growth of normal cells. In fact, when the chromosome content of a normal cell becomes disturbed, signaling pathway is usually activated that deals to the, leads to the self-destruction or apoptosis of the cell. In contrast, cancer cells typically fail to elicit the apoptotic response even when their chromosome content becomes highly deranged. Protection from apoptosis is another important hallmark that distinguishes that cancer cells often depend on glycolysis. It is considered an anaerobic metabolic pathway. Anaerobic metabolic pathway. This property may reflect the high metabolic requirements of cancer cells and an inadequate blood supply within the tube tumor. And uh, conditions of hypoxia or reduced O2, cancer cells activate a transcription factor called HIF that reduces the formation of new blood vessels and promotes the migratory properties of the cells which may contribute to the spread of the tumor. However, even when oxygen is plentiful, many tumor cells continue to generate much of their ATP by glycolysis called anaerobic glycolysis. Even though glycolysis generates much less ATP per glucose than does oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, it produces ATP at a more rapid rate. The increased uptake of glucose by tumor cells compared to normal cells can be caused as a means to locate metastasic tumors within the body using a PET scan. It is these properties which can be demonstrated in culture together with their tendency to spread to distinct sites within the body that makes cancer cells such a threat to the well-being of entire organism. Next topic, the causes of cancer. In 1775, Percival Pott, a British surgeon, made the first non-correlation between an environmental agent and the development of cancer. Pott concluded that the high incidence of cancer of the nasal cavity and the skin of the scrotum in chimney sweeps was due to their chronic exposure to soot. Within the past several decades, the carcinogenic chemicals in soot have been isolated along with hundreds of
other compounds shown to cause cancer in laboratory animals. In addition to a diverse array of chemicals, a number of other types of agents are also carcinogenic including ionizing radiation and a variety of DNA and RNA containing viruses. Ionizing radiation and DNA and RNA containing viruses. All of the agents have one property in common. They alter the genome. They alter the genome. Carcinogenic chemicals such as those present in soot or cigarette smoke can almost always be shown either to be directly mutagenic or to be converted to mutagenic compounds by cellular enzymes. Converted to mutagenic compounds by cellular enzymes. Similarly, ultraviolet radiation which is the leading cause of skin cancer is also strongly mutagenic. A number of viruses can infect mammalian cells growing in cell culture, transforming them into cancer cells. These viruses are broadly divided into two large groups, DNA tumor viruses and RNA tumor viruses, depending on the type of nucleic acid found within the mature virus particle. Among the DNA viruses capable of transforming cells are polyoma virus, simian virus 40, adenovirus and herpes-like viruses. Then RNA tumor viruses or retroviruses are similar to the similar in structure to HIV and are the subject of the experiment, experimental pathways which can be found at the end of the chapter. Now tumor viruses can transform cells because they carry genes whose products interfere with the cell's normal growth regulating activities. Although tumor viruses were an invaluable tool for researchers in identifying numerous genes involved in cell transformation, they are associated with only a small number of human cancers. Other types of viruses are however linked to as many as 20% of cancers worldwide. In most cases, these viruses generally increase a person's risk of developing the cancer rather than being the sole determinant responsible for the disease. This relationship between viral infection and cancer is illustrated by human papilloma virus which can be transmitted through sexual activity and is increasing the frequency in the population. Although the virus is present in about 90% of cervical cancers, Indicating its importance in development of disease, the vast majority of women who have been infected with the virus will never develop this malignancy. HPV is also linked as a primary causative agent of cancers of the mouth and tongue in both men and women. Effective vaccines against this virus, human papilloma virus, are now available. Other viruses linked to human cancers include hepatitis B virus, which is associated with liver cancer. Epstein Barr virus, which is associated with Burkitt's lymphoma in areas where malaria is common, and herpes virus or HHV8, which is associated with Kaposi's sarcoma. Certain gastric lymphomas are associated with chronic infection by the stomach dwelling bacterium Helicobacter pylori, which can also cause ulcers. Recent evidences suggest that many of these cancers linked to persistent viral and bacterial infections are actually caused by the chronic inflammation that is triggered by the presence of the pathogen. Inflammation, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD, which is also characterized by chronic inflammation, has been associated with an increased risk of colon cancer. These findings have been caused to suggest to look more closely at the general process of inflammation as a previously unexplored factor in the development of many types of cancers. Determining the causes of different types of cancer is an endeavor carried out by epidemiologists, researchers who study disease patterns and populations. The causes of certain cancers are obvious. Smoking causes lung cancer. Exposure to ultraviolet radiation causes skin cancer and inhaling asbestos fibers causes mesothelioma. But despite a large number of studies, we are still uncertain as to the cause of most types of human cancer. Humans live in complex environments and are exposed to many potential carcinogens 
in a cha- changing pattern over a period of decades attempting to determine the cause of cancer from a mountain of statistical data obtained from the answers to questionnaires about individuals lifestyle has proven very difficult the importance of environmental factors like diet is seen most clearly in studies of the children of couples that have moved from asia to the united states or europe these individuals no longer exhibit a high rate of gastric cancer as occurs in asia but instead are subject to an elevated risk of colon and breast cancer which is characteristic of western con- countries There is a general consensus among epidemiologists that diet can play a major role in the risk of developing cancer. Cancer rates are higher among obese individuals than the non-obese population and studies in primates suggest that a calorie restricted diet protects against cancer. Recent attention has focused on elevated levels of insulin and insulin like growth factor that are found in obese individuals are being a primary cause for increasing cancer incidence in this group there are also evidence that some ingredients in the diet such as animal fat and alcohol can increase the risk of developing cancer whereas certain compounds found in food items may reduce that risk examples of the later include isoflavins found in soya sulfur affines found in broccoli and egcg found in tea several widely prescribed drugs also have a preventative effect drugs that interfere with the action of estrogen like tamoxifen or raloxifen raloxifen or the metabolism of testosterone like finasteride can reduce the in incidence of breast cancer or prostate cancer respectively long term use of non steroid anti inflammatory drugs like nsaids such as aspirin and indomethacin has been shown to markedly re- decrease the risk of colon cancer they are thought to have its effect by inhibiting cyclooxygenase 2 an enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of hormone like prostaglandins which promote the growth of intestinal polyps the cancer suppressing action of nsaids supports the idea that inflammation plays a major role in the development of various cancers persons who have taken the anti diabetes drug metformin also appear to have a significantly reduced risk of developing cancer in this case the benefit may be a result of drug action and lowering the circulating levels of insulin and igf1 then let's learn about genetics of cancer cancer is one of the two leading causes of death in western countries afflicting approximately one in every three individuals viewed in this way cancer is a very common disease but at the cellular level the development of a cancer is remarkably rare event when the cells of a cancerous tumor are genetically scrutinized they are invariably found to have arisen from a single cell this unlike other diseases that require modifications of a large number of cells cancer results from uncontrolled proliferation of a single wayward cell cancer is said to be monoclonal consider for a moment that human body contains millions of cells billions of which undergo cell divisions on any given day though almost any one of these binding cells may have the potential to change in genetic composition and grow into a malignant tumor this only occurs in about one third of the human population during an entire lifetime one of the primary reasons why a greater number of cells do not give rise to cancerous tumors in that malignant transformation requires more than a single genetic alteration we can distinguish between two types of genetic alterations that might take us more likely to develop a particular type of cancer those that we inherit from our parent germline mutations and those that occur during our lifetime somatic mutations there are a few types of mutations that we can inherit that make us much more likely to develop cancer the study of the mutations has taught us a great deal about how malform 
malfunctioning genes can lead to the development of cancer some of these inherited cancer syndromes will be discussed later in the section however for the most part inherited mutations are not a major factor in the occurrence of most cases of diseases one way to determine an overall estimate of the impact of inheritance and in tumor formation is to ascertain the likelihood that two identical twins will develop the same type of cancer by the time the individual reaches a certain age studies of this type suggest that the likelihood two 75 year old identical twins will share a particular cancer such as breast cancer or prostate cancer is generally between 5 and 15 percent depending on the type of cancer clearly the genes that we inherit have a significant influence on our risks of developing cancer but the greatest impact comes from the genes that are altered during our lifetime the development of a malignant tumor or tumorogenesis is a multi-step process characterized by a progression of permanent genetic alterations in a single line of cells which may occur over the course of many successive cell divisions and take decades to complete each genetic change may elicit a particular feature of malignant state such as protection from apoptosis as these genetic changes gradually occur the cells in the line becomes increasingly less responsive to the body's normal regulatory machinery and better able to invade normal tissues according to this concept tumorogenesis requires that the cell responsible for initiating the cancer be capable of a large number of cell divisions this recruit requirement has focused a great deal of attention on the types of cells that are present in a tissue that might have the potential to develop into a tumor the most common solid tumors such as those of the breast colon prostate and lung arise in epithelial tissues that are normally engaged in a relatively high level of cell division the same is the case of leukemias which develop in rapidly dividing blood forming tissues the cells of most tissues can be roughly divided into three groups like stem cells which possess ultimately proliferation proliferation potential and limited proliferation potential have the capacity to produce more of themselves and can give rise to all of the cells of the tissue then progenitor cell which are derived from stem cells and possess a limited ability to proliferate and the differentiated end products of the tissue which generally lack the capability to divide examples of these three groups are very important given the fact that tumor formation requires that a cell be capable of extensive division two general scenario have been considered for the origin of tumors according to one scenario cancer arises from within the relatively small population of stem cells that inhibit each adult tissue inhibit each adult tissue given their long life and unlimited division potential stem cells have the opportunity to accumulate the mutations required for malignant transformation according to another scenario progenitor cells can give rise to malignant tumors by acquiring certain properties such as the capability of unlimited proliferation as part of the process of tumor progression and these two scenarios are not mutually exclusive in that some tumors are thought to arise from stem cells and others from the progenitor cell population as a cancer grows the cell is in the tumor mass are subjected to a type of natural selection that drives the accumulation of cells with properties that are most favorable for tumor growth for example only those tumors containing cells that maintain the length of their telomeres will be capable of unlimited growth any cell that appears within a tumor that happens to express telomeres will have a tremendous growth advantage over other cells that fail to express the enzyme over time the telomeres expressing cells will flourish while the non expressing cells will die off and all of the cells in the tumor will remain telomeres will contain telomeres expression of telomeres illustrates another important feature of tumor progression not all of these changes result from genetic mutation 
the activation of telomerase expression can be considered an epigenetic change one that results from the activation of a gene that is normally repressed as this type of activation process likely involves changes in the structure of chromatin and around the gene and or changes in the state of dna methylation once the epigenetic change has occurred it is transmitted to all of the progeny of that cell and consequently represents a permanent inheritable alteration even after they have become malignant cancer cells continue to accumulate mutations and epigenetic changes that make them increasingly abnormal this genetic instability makes the disease difficult to treat by conventional chemotherapy because cells often arise within the tumor mass that are resistant to the drug the genetic changes that occur during tumor progression are often accompanied by histological changes that is changes in the appearance of the cell the initial changes often produce cells that can be identified as precancerous which indicates that they have gained some of the properties of a cancer cell such as loss of certain growth controls but lack the capability to invade normal tissues or metastasize to distant sites the pap smear is a test for detecting pancreatic cells in the epithelial lining of the cervix the development of cervical cancer typically progresses over a period of more than 10 years and is characterized by cells that appear increasingly abnormal less well differentiated than normal cells with larger nuclei when cells having an abnormal appearance are detected the precancerous lesion in the cervix will be located and destroyed by laser treatment freezing or surgery some tissues often generate benign tumors which contain cells that have proliferated to form a mass that possesses little threat of becoming malignant the molds that we all possess are an example of benign tumors studies indicate that the pigment cells that compose the mold have undergone a response that causes them to enter a permanent state of growth arrest referred to as a senescence so senescence is apparently triggered to these pigment cells after they have undergone certain of the genetic changes that would have otherwise set them on a course to becoming a malignant cancer this process of forced senescence represents another pathway that has evolved to restrict the development of cancers in higher organisms the molecular basis of senescence is very important so a surprising fact the molds that we all possess are an example of benign tumors which undergo a process of growth arrest a permanent state of growth arrest referred to as senescence and then when we try to explain the proposed cells of origin of malignant tumors tissues contain cells in various stages of commitment and differentiation this includes stem cells multipotent progenitor cells that can give rise to a variety of types of differentiated cells committed progenitor cells that can give rise to only one type of differentiated cell and the differentiated cells themselves according to the model depicted here tumors can arise from either tissue stem cells or progenitor cells so in some cases at least these different cells of origin give rise to different types of cancers so oncogenic event is happening tissue stem cell is there that will lead to tumor subtype x or this tissue stem cell will undergo oncogenic event a and then pluripotent progenitor cell will be formed after that that will transform to committed progenitor cell mature cells then committed progenitor cell again undergo oncogenic event a that will form tumor subtype z but the pluri pluripotent progenitor cell will transform to tumor subtype y in some cases so this committed progenitor cell will form mature cells which are of not producing tumor so detection of abnormal or 
pre malignant cells in a pepsmia normal squamous epithelial cells of the cervix cervix the cells have a uniform shape with a small centrally located nucleus abnormal cells from the case of carcinoma in situ which is a pre invasive cancer of the cervix the cells have heterogeneous shapes and large nuclei when we see large nuclei we need to identify the cells as cancer cells in case of cervical cancer with the help of pep pap smear pap then tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes breaks and accelerators the genes that have been implicated in carcinogenic are divided into two broad categories tumor suppressor suppressor genes and oncogenes which we will be learning with the help of next video thank you for listening